Good evening and uh, welcome to the abundant life in the now series. How are you tonight? Thank you. I pray you have had a lovely time. Once again, I have to begin by thanking our young people, the ones who took the time to bless us with beautiful music, as well as all our young people moving up and down, just making sure that people can see us in the United States, they can hear us wherever. Um, People in the uh, um, control room and the camera people and all those who are moving up and down. I pray that God Almighty will continue to hold you together and for you just to uh, realize how important it is to give a part of your service to the Lord who created you. Tonight, I would like to speak from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35, Mark chapter 4, from 35, where the Bible says, and I as I do this, uh, first of all, let me also just appreciate those who went before me. Beautiful presentations in prophecy as well as uh, family life. Um, um, what a blessing it is uh, to serve with uh, competent people, knowledgeable people. I am blessed and I pray that God will continue to lift his servants to uh, make sure that uh, their ministries continue to flourish. Mark chapter 4 beginning from 35, the Bible says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they, and they awoke him and say to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I want to speak on the subject asleep in a storm. Asleep in a storm. At the end of uh, a particularly a very busy day when uh, Jesus should have been saying to his disciples, we've done our part this particular day and I think it is important that we all retire. We all go to, to rest. At the end of an exceedingly busy day, Jesus comes to his disciples and he says to them, Let us go to the 
other side. Let us go. There is something to, to be said about this. You know, when you are Lord or Master over something, you have the right to walk to whoever it is that you superintend over and say, friend, there is a need for us to work on this. Those of you who have uh, people that work for you, you know how it is when you employ people that work for you. There are times when you will simply call shorts at difficult times. And those who work for you will understand that there is a sense in which you can say what you want to say under those circumstances. And they will obey. And I think this is how everybody who subscribes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ ought to view life. That Christ can walk into my situation at any point, any time. It could be in the morning, it could be at noon time, it could be at night. Christ has the right to walk in because he is Lord over my life. We cannot uh, 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 stop to emphasize the point that the Apostle Paul makes in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 when he says, I have been crucified with Jesus. It's no longer about me. My life is no longer important. What is important is the life of the one who has now become my Lord. So Christ can come in. Now, just imagine the people are tired at this particular time. Uh, instead of dismissing them to go to rest, he comes late in the afternoon and he says, guys, it's time for us to go to the other side of the lake. Now, there is something I have appreciated about the disciples at this particular time. They are where they ought to be, by Christ's side, beside the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, oftentimes as uh, a child of God, I must constantly, I must I, I, I be asking myself a question. Am I where I am supposed to be as far as God is concerned? Because it is very possible that I could be in a place where God doesn't want me to be. My dear friends, in order to live the kind of abundant life that we keep talking about, we must always remember to be where God wants us to be. And I see that this is what, what has happened. The disciples are right where they ought to be at this particular time. And I ask you who are in this auditorium, including those who are watching, are you where you are supposed to be as far as God is concerned? Are you where you are supposed to be? Think about your career. Are you where you are supposed to be? Think about your relationships. Are you where you are supposed to be? Because when it comes to every facet of our life, there is the foot of God that must be there. Every single thing that we go through in life, since our will, since our lives have been bought by Jesus Christ. He has a foot in everything that we do. Let me talk to our young people. Because oftentimes our young people don't take the time to look at this issue 
of relationships. As far as they are concerned, the important thing is that I love this particular person and we are having a wonderful time. The question is, when you look at Jesus Christ who has now become your Lord, in your relationship, are you where Christ wants you to be? You will never be happy in this life if you move away from where God wants you to be. We have talked about this. Key areas in our lives such as our careers, such as our professions. You cannot leave this to your own concoctions and hope that you will be happy. You will not be happy. You must constantly ask the question, in this career, in this thing I am engaged in, am I where God wants me to be? The disciples in this particular story are exactly where they must be. Now let me say something here. And this is that the disciples are very close to Jesus Christ. When we talk about unity, unity cannot be achieved when people are far away from Christ. This is how it works. If you have looked at the wheel of a bicycle, it has a hub and it also has spokes. The closer the spokes are to the hub, the closer they are to each other. And the far removed they are from the hub, the far removed they are from each other. We cannot achieve unity when we choose individually to stay away from Christ. Here at this particular congregation we call New Life, you will not be able to achieve unity if members of this particular congregation don't make it their effort to draw themselves to the hub where Christ is. Because when we all draw closer to the hub, Jesus Christ, we will draw closer to one another. At the family level, it's the same thing. The family cannot enjoy unity when people are far away from Christ. You can't. So when we talk about reading the Bible, why is it important to read the Bible? The Bible is what draws us close to the will of God. If we are not reading the Bible, we will not understand the intentions of God. We will just be drifting each person wherever we want to be. We cannot achieve unity. The disciples are able to achieve unity because each one of them is closer, close to the hub. And the closer you are to the hub, which is Christ Jesus, the closer you will be to one another. Unity is very, very important. It is critical. Now we must also say something here. You know, we are all being led by God. The disciples in this story are being led. And I see how it must have been beautiful for them at the end of that particular day to be where they needed to be. In this particular case, to go home and simply rest. But no, it's not time to rest. The one who is leading them does not feel that it is time for them to rest. Hear me right here. Because there is an important principle. We can get comfortable where we are to the point where when God's time is that we need to move to 
the next point we will not be able to move to the next point if we are not careful. It has happened in the Old Testament. The reason why that cloud would always hover above the sanctuary was to lead the people that at the time it stood still. If you turn to Numbers chapter 9 and you begin from 15, every time that clouds uh, stood still uh, uh, by, by, by the sanctuary there. It was an indication that God was saying, for now I want you to be here. And every time the cloud started moving, it was an indication again that God wanted these people to be moving. Now, we can get comfortable. Abraham had been living in the city of Urim for 70 years. It was quite comfortable. He loved it that way. But God appeared to him and said, Abraham, even though this is the place where you want to be, I am giving you directions. It is time for you to move from here in Urim to a land I will show you. We can never ever be happy and find fulfillment in this life as God's people if we are not listening carefully to the intentions of God for our lives. If you go to the book of Numbers in chapters 13 and 14, in uh, chapter 13, God instructs Moses and he says, Can you identify? leaders of people. I want them to go and spy the land. And indeed for 40 days they are out in the land. And when they come back they give a bad report. Ten of them a bad report and two of them a good report. God wanted them to move to the promised land. If you go to chapter 14 of the book of Numbers, God's people didn't want to move. What was the consequence? God says to them, now, because you don't want to move, here is what will happen. Number one, all of you who came out of Egypt except for Joshua and Caleb, you will die in the wilderness. And number two, each of the 40 days you spent there as spies, now, each day will be a year. We need to be very careful. There are times when the voice of God is very clear that where we are is not where we are supposed to be. It should not, the consideration should not always just be because we are comfortable here, because we are making money here, because of all these considerations, we must be listening to the voice of God critically so that we understand his intentions. Money is not everything. God can move into your situation and bring a discomfort to your situation because he knows you need to go to the next point in order to experience joy and fulfillment. So he comes and he says, let's go to the other side of the lake. And as they get on the boat, the Bible says that suddenly a great windstorm came and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. There's a big lesson here for all of us. Moving in the same boat with Christ does not mean that we will not experience problems. Moving in the same boat with Christ does not mean that we will not experience challenges. As a matter of fact, the probability is more if you choose to be on the side of God you will experience hardships and many things because the devil 
knows. We read that particular Bible text uh, that says that he who has the son has life. So the devil knows the closer you get to Christ, oh, he will unleash all hell on you to make sure that you are discouraged. But we need to know that just because we are in the same boat with Christ does not mean that we will not experience challenges. They will be there. And we see this. And we, we have also said, you know, this must also be a lesson to all of us to know that in life, life is a balance between high moments and low moments. It's a balance. And when we forget this particular principle, we will be having problems in life. Because every time something negative happens, the temptation is that we interpret it to be bad life. It might be bad life, but necessary in our growth as we grow in God. So God will allow downward moments in order to help us understand that. This side of eternity, life is always going to be a balance between high moments and low moments. So, they were happy, Christ was in their midst, and yet storms arose. It's very, very important to understand this. Now, interestingly, as you read this particular text, Christ was asleep. The question is, how can you sleep in a storm? He was asleep. Ellen White tries to give some explanation to this. I read something in the book of Desire of Ages where Ellen White says on page 336, she says, uh, regarding that particular sleep, she says, it was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. In faith, in love, Jesus understood something we all struggle with. That, you know, there can never be in your experience as a child of God something that erupts where we say God is not in it. I don't know how I can put this in order for us to begin to understand how important this principle is. That each day, no matter what challenges life brings our way, we must always remember that the footprint of God is in every chapter of our life. God never leaves us. And when you begin to view life from that angle, that regardless of what happens, God is still in control. And if he is in control, there is no need for you to worry because God knows what he is doing. He does not bring trouble upon you in order to destroy you. No, God is always there. But our challenge is, Negative situations always we view them as if God is not in the picture. The reason why Jesus was able to sleep is that he understood my father is the father of love and I am able. Whatever it is that he allows to come my way, I know that he is still in control. What are you going through as an individual? How is life treating you as an individual? If you can only remember that regardless of how dark the situation appears right now, if you can remember that God is in it, you can sleep in the midst of a storm. You can. But we forget. So, texts such as Romans 8 verse 28 we can't even remember that 
those texts do exist where the apostle Paul that where the apostle Paul says Romans 8 28 all things work together for good not that all things are good okay there are some situations that are going to be bad but whether bad or good all of them work together for good and the reason is that in each chapter in each occurrence in each episode the footprint of God is there so there is no need to worry about anything this is the reason why Jesus could sleep in a storm and I the aspect of you know the, the pillow um, I know we we can't uh, look at that um, uh, too literally but you know to me uh, it evokes something in me when you find yourself in trouble what sort of pillow do you rest your problems on I was talking to one young lady and she tells me pastor it is not possible for me to sleep nowadays as a matter of fact I even drink I'm talking about an Adventist I even drink why do you drink well I drink in order to just find some solace to find a way to run away from my problems that's a pillow she uses our young people, some of our young people use the pillow of alcohol and in using alcohol they think they will take care of the problems. You cannot take care of those problems by resorting to alcohol. Our young people, even in this church here at New Life, some of them, they resort to drugs. Young people, into drugs. That is a pillow. They are resting their head on. And some people, their pillow is money. As long as I have money, I am comfortable. But let me put it to us. Money, drugs, alcohol, they will not bring peace. Or oh, as one person has put it, our Lives are restless until we find rest in God. So in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you want true rest, you need to lay your head on the pillow. At Jesus Christ, the one who loves you with whom nothing is impossible. If you bring your troubles before Jesus Christ, he will be able to offer solace and comfort and peace and rest. Because Jesus Christ came into this world to offer solace, to offer rest. He came into this world in order to save humankind. So my young people in this church as well as those who are, are hearing me, those who are watching, here is my message for you tonight. Oh, alcohol will not sort the issue. Drugs will not sort the issue. Money cannot bring rest to your troubles. I offer Jesus Christ, and I love the beautiful way in which he puts it, Ye, all of you who are heavy laden, come to me. And you know, the beautiful thing about this kind of invitation is that it doesn't matter how many of you will come. You can come at a time, a million of you, two billion of you, at the same time when each of you comes, it will appear to me as if you are the only one who is alive on planet Earth. So it's not a thing where you say, I want to see Pastor Mons, or I want to see Pastor Akali, and all of these people. And these people are limited. They can only do so much. 
when it comes to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how many of you, it doesn't matter what time you decide to walk into his presence. He will offer help. Let me say something. On Sabbath, I'm going to be here. And I want to pray for our young people who are hooked on alcohol, who are hooked on drugs, who are hooked on sex, and all of these addictions. I want to offer them Jesus Christ. I know that Jesus has a power. He has a capacity. This is the reason why in Luke 19 verse 10 he says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the reason why in talking to Nicodemus, he says in John chapter 317, God did not send his son into the world in order to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God will save. It doesn't matter how deep you have gone into drugs. God can rescue you. It doesn't matter how deep you have gone into alcoholism. God has the power. God is specialized in saving people. This is the reason why he sent his son to come and die for you. So, on Sabbath, you who are around this place and you know that you are challenged in that area, I'm going to offer an opportunity to you in the power of Christ. And I know God can do it. He can do it. Asleep. Why was he sleeping? He was sleeping because he was exhausted. He was tired as a human being. And you know, far from this being a negative reality, for me, this is a positive reality. He was tired. He was exo exhausted. So he needed to rest. I talk about experience. We're talking about experience. I read a book by one man who wrote something on when you lose a spouse, if you want to remarry, what are the principles? That person had never experienced I never experienced the loss of a spouse. It was basically theory. They don't have the experience. They don't know how it feels. You can do research and put up pieces and, and, and offer to people. But let me tell you something. There is something different about a person who speaks with experience. Jesus. Oh, if uh, heaven had wanted, if heaven... I, I, I was at this view they would have simply said okay here in heaven where we are we will use some magic we'll use you know whatever we do have all the power we uh, you know can communicate in such a way that we are able to save people but no in the mind of God with whom nothing is impossible God decided that in order to save human beings, somebody had to come and live life like a human being so that he understands our situation from the angle of experience. That's the reason why in Hebrews, and we need to read this, Hebrews chapter 4, listen to this, 15, how it is beautifully uh, put for us by the one who wrote these words. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Then it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and, and, and find grace to help in time of need. We are dealing with somebody with experience, not a novice who graduates from medical school. We are dealing with somebody, not a novice who graduates from a teaching institution. 
we are dealing with somebody who has been through our experience when we appear before him he will not condemn because he has been through our experience i love this it's so beautiful he rested he was exhausted as a human being he understands what the feeling is when you are tempted you are tired you don't know what to do you don't know where to go he went through it all there by the cross as he hung on the cross he cries out to the father my god my god why have you forsaken me jesus has gone through the process of rejection he understands when you feel lonely you feel dejected jesus understands from the angle of experience he is able to help you he's able to help us let me end it this way because i know i have overshot this is 1932 but here is a point i would like to close on storms should always be viewed from God's perspective. Let me say this again. Storms should always be viewed from God's perspective, not your perspective. When God was looking at this, it was nothing. When the disciples were looking at the storm, it was something. If only they had looked at this event from the standpoint of God, they would not have panicked. You know, when I read this story, I get, you know, this sense of frustration. Can you imagine what would have happened if they did not panic? If they had their eyes focused on Christ and they had known that it was impossible for that particular boat to sink as long as Christ was there. We would have in our records a miracle that would defy all logic. Now because they were panicking, they destroy what should have been a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful experience. Now we, we don't know how it would have appeared. You see, the storm is raging. They are looking to Christ. The storm is raging. They are not uh, afraid. They are not anxious about anything. Jesus is asleep. That boat would not have sunk. It would have sailed all the way. And what a miracle it would have been to sail through storms. What a miracle. They disturbed the floor. They woke him. And now what we have is just a little thing. It would have been, you know, uh, you know something to really uh, uh, see the power of God, to experience the power of God. Please, when a storm occurs, don't focus your attention on the storm. Focus your attention on God. Every storm has to be looked at that way. The reason why people panic, they panic because they are not looking at God, they are looking at the storm. May God help us to look to him when we are under stress because it is possible to sleep in the midst of a storm. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, this story, the disciples messed it up they should have simply been looking to you as you slept. And the boat would have continued riding through the storm. It didn't matter that water was filling. You had the capacity. You were in the boat. But now look what has happened. They give us a simple thing from your hand when we should have been looking at this particular storm from the angle of riding on the billows, riding on the storm and yet reaching the other side. 
So help us in the storm to have your perspective. Then we'll be able to sleep like Jesus slept in the storm. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our young people, can we end the program?